All right, everybody. We've decided we're going to give that Ben Berg a tryout as a speaker today. So this will be their first time speaking, I swear. Uh, but I'm very happy to welcome all of our speakers. Catherine used to also be an Athens uh, co-chapter president. And I think almost all of you know Michelle Menard from her previous appearances at Siege. And very glad to have her back. We missed her horribly last year. And the three Sorry. of them are presenting on a topic I really think we need to discuss more in this industry, neurodivergence in the workplace. I think this is critical. It's something we need to recognize and can make much better workplaces for everyone. So I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over to these three wonderful people. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Yay. Neurodivergence in the workspace. Um, yeah, so as Andrew said, I think this is something that we don't talk about ever, like almost as like a taboo type subject. And I'm not saying that I certainly have all the answers and I'm pretty sure Catherine Bindle neither, but someone needs to start the discussion. So hopefully we can do that here and just get it rolling. Um, and even if we just, you know, talk about things and don't even come up with solutions, that's okay. Um, we can just get it rolling. So uh, as Andrew said, we have Catherine Bin and my name is Michelle. Um, do you guys want to just do a quick intro of yourself and uh, also kind of like about neurodiversity in yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm Catherine. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the University of Georgia, and I've been diagnosed with ADD since I was five. My whole family has been diagnosed with ADD since before I was born. Um, <laughs> and so that's just normal for me. And so that's, it's kind of, that's been my journey. It's finding out, wait a minute, I am different. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, but yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I am Ben. I was born. Uh, I was uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD uh, around the same time. I think when I was five. Uh, a couple years later, in middle school, I was diagnosed with autism, um, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I come from a slightly different route. Um, I always knew. I was a little bit odd and different. I just kind of chalked it up though to being odd and different. Like obviously it was into the quote, not girly interest type yeah. things ever in my entire life. I wasn't diagnosed with autism until I was 36. Um, so quite a bit later, would have been nice to know sooner. <laughs> Made a lot of things in retrospect like, oh, oh, oh. So there's a lot of like, oh shit. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've had the same experience, except I have it about every two months. And I'm like, wait, wait, that's that's the ADD thing. Yeah, that's the, that's the oh, thing. yeah. Ah. <laughs> so it's never too late. Yay. Um, so what is neurodiversity and neurodivergence? Um, it's like a big word. It's got a lot of stuff and it is not talking about a single thing. So here's just a cute graphic I stole off the interwebs. Um, it is a whole bunch of different things and some people can exhibit multiple ones um, at the same time and or just one. Um, some things like autism, dyslexia, OCD, anxiety, all these different things all fall under the umbrella of neurodivergence. Go in. Um, and just, I'm just going to a couple little slides first before I get going, just to provide background information. And when people talk about things like the spectrum, um, oftentimes the visual in people's heads, it's a line. And that, you know, oh, well, someone is like mildly or low functioning, or I hate that word, and then high functioning or severe and all those things. And they envision it as a linear line and you just kind of move across the line one way or the other. And that is so absolutely not the case. The spectrum is really more like, you know, one of those radial pie chart type things where you can put dots on certain areas. You could be very vocal and have high speech capability, but, you know, have absolutely horrific social ability. And they too do not, you know, it's not like you have, you have to have both because you're here like a line would be, it's, it's all over the place. So just keep that in mind that it is more of this um, pie charty radial type thing. And they can't, and these kinds of behaviors can, uh, what's the word? exhibit in different ways, so like poor eye contact over here. Like I don't meet people's eyeballs. I've gotten very good at staring people's nose or right here. I'm not looking at your eyes ever, trust me. Um, anxiety, social difficulty, noise sensitivity, just like having like constant little noises, just loud noises being extremely um, obnoxious and can't deal with it. Aggression, obviously bad. We don't want to probably uh, work with people who are overly aggressive, but all these other ones are things that um, shouldn't be a problem to accommodate in a workspace 
type environment. And oftentimes they're not accommodated. And these kinds of behaviors are often screened out during the interview process, which is very annoying, um, which comes to this slide. And um, Catherine, ben, please just interrupt if you want to interject. Yeah, anything, well, yeah and I was going to, yeah, I was going to jump in like with ADD oh. as well. A lot of people are like, oh, well, that's just, oh, they can't pay attention. Oh, they can't. No, it's a lot more yeah. than that. Um, like the big problem uh, for me is uh, getting motivated to go do stuff. And so it's not so much that I can't focus on something. It's just more like, ah, well, I do really enjoy playing my games, but that's a lot of effort. <laughs> And so trying to get that up there to even, even stuff I enjoy, but especially things I don't like the activation for most people's here, but mine's way up here. Uh, if you can see my little icon on there, but, um, but yeah, it, it's just like uh, autism. It, it's in, in the DSM, the diagnostic something manual for the uh, disorders. It, uh, it's listed as three different kind of types and it's more of a hodgepodge of different um problems and symptoms and the more I read about it from other people it's like wait we really shouldn't be categorized as the same disorder because mm -hmm. there's just so many different ways to handle it so you just have to look at at, at your own stuff yeah, yeah. uh going back just a, a moment to the, the previous label with the slider between uh like high and low function mm -hmm. uh functioning um those labels are problematic because it reduces a person's value to whether or not they can uh, produce value in a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's very true. All right. So I found this slide and these uh, data points for the UK. Um, I wasn't able to truly find a lot of good data in the US. Surprise, surprise, we rocked the mental health thing. Um, and so you just take with a grain, so this is the UK data, but it's most likely very similar everywhere, that about 10% of the population there um, is neurodivergent in one of these various different ways. And this one was specifically about autism and that, you know, 16% of autistic adults are full time, are employed full time, good. But 73% of them are not, and they want to be. That is a huge discrepancy. And, you know, it's only a small number of people who are, do have such a severe case and like, you know, a representations that they do struggle to have a full-time job, but there are all these other people who want to work and they want to be out there doing things, doing what they love, being like, you know, just having something in their life that can be meaning and like being like, you know, out there with the normies. Um, <laughs> That's a problem. This is the problem right here. You've got 73% of these people who want to work and they are being screened out of the process and not giving the chance. Um, so we put together a couple of different talking points of things we can uh, discuss and go over. I don't have a preference for what order um, people might want to go in. If you guys out in chat land um, have a preference or want to talk about something, um, you can message uh, directly in the chat in YouTube's. Or if you actually want to get involved and talk to, we can pull you in to the Discord chattiness and you can actually talk live if you so desire. Um, so I think Andrew said he was going to manage that because I am sucky at the Discords. Oh my God. Like getting this just working this morning was horrifically bad. Um, as best I can. Cool. Let me see if I can switch back out of this without breaking everything. Is everything still okay? Uh, hey. Silence means yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I right. do, you want me to leave, um, do you guys want me to leave the slide up or do you want me to take it down? Uh, either way, I can well, pull it can up. leave it up for now and just yeah, start well, yeah, talking a little way. as questions come in. Yeah, and, and, sure. and gives Chatland a, a reference for stuff we were thinking about. Okay, cool. And then if someone can monitor Chatland for questions, that would be awesome because I have on a single monitor and I can't keep uh, them all up at the same time. So, so yeah. awesome. Thank you. Woo. Um, so... I guess something we could start off with is like, you know, this whole idea of, you know, even starting with this idea of like diagnoses, we've all been formally diagnosed in one way or another, but a lot of people are not. Um, some people might suspect that they are and don't, and that's, you know, and then never actually get the formal thing. That doesn't bother me. I think that's totally fine. Um, but what I've seen, at least in some places, that if you don't have the formal diagnoses, that a lot of workplaces are less accommodating because they actually need that stupid piece of paper to be like well i don't want to do anything for you because yeah. you could just be making this up because you want like special treatment or something 
Uh oh. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Well, in that vein too. Um, it, for me, uh, like I said, I was diagnosed when I was five, and I've never had academic. Uh, uh, I can't think of the right word right now, but I, I've never had accommodations for that, and it's more so because I was stubborn. And it only made me work twice as hard. Um, I should have taken advantage of those. And I don't feel like it would have been. Uh, it, it wouldn't have said anything less about what I did. But I felt like I had friends who were like, yeah, you know, I can go stay the night before. We'll be good. I could just, you know, wing it. I'm like, no. <laughs> I have to read this page like six times to get that same information. And if I had had, you know, it, one of the big accommodations for ADD is having additional time on tests. And so, you know, that, that would have been really nice, even though I still did very well in school. Um, I have uh, a, a twin brother who got a lot of uh, extended time on a whole bunch of different things. And I was always like, no, I don't need that. I'm, yeah. I don't, uh, I'm not going to take advantage of that. Um, which you're you're in a in a school system that like gives you a benefit. Why wouldn't you take it? Yeah. You don't have anything to prove. Uh, you can just um, if you can do better, uh, then accept help. Uh, that's true as much in school as it is in everything else in real life. Um, I only did as well as I did uh, with Pushmo, for example, because I, ex I accepted a, a help from people. Exactly. And it, uh, I was getting the PowerPoint pulled back up. Um, yeah, we don't know what happened to Michelle, but we're bringing in Wonder Jay, who's one of our mods who uh, wanted to ah. give some input as well. And I really appreciate y'all doing this. It's always been interesting for me that, uh, people would always say that my friends were weird, which always insulted me because that meant I wasn't the weird one. It looks okay. like she's back in general, right, so you could drive her in. Bring her on and back into this chat. Yeah, it, and and yeah, exactly. Like you just said, like with the weird part, I've always, I've never thought about that. But then, you know, you oh. go out and interact with, you know, the neurotypicals. And it's like, wait, that's not, you mean, you guys don't hold six conversations at once? That's not normal? Hold on. <laughs> there are so many instances of that that I yeah. could point to. Welcome back. I'm back. Yeah, welcome back. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll try again. Yeah, Discord decided to want to install updates and kick me oh. out. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course it did. <laughs> All right. Let's see. All right. Let's get back to this prison thing. Oh, my God. I swear I work in technology. Okay. Yeah, so we, we were just uh, going off of what you'd said right before you left, which was... Mm. Uh, um, taking advantage. Yeah, taking advantage of um, accommodations you can actually utilize if you go through the formal process. With, for me, it was with my school um, that I just didn't use because I was stubborn and that was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and it, I, yeah, I definitely remember when I used to... Um, when I used to teach um, colleges online, I would, you know, be part of the training was like, oh, certain students are um, allowed certain accommodations based on, you know, huge different criteria. And, you know, you got training to make sure you did it. I was surprised by how many students didn't then take advantage of it because I was told who, which students had it and what they could use. And then they, they didn't like, it's not, I mean, it's not, and then no one else has to know about it, especially it's an online course. No one knows if you got an extra two hours on this exam or not. Like, yeah. It's You're going to laugh. Me and Catherine were talking about how we didn't take advantage in school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I still, from high school, I was still valedictorian, but I probably could have done half of the amount of work to still get there. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, and I, I guess like when I... Oh my God! Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. I did not have my voice on for the live stream. So oh. I was reading Ryan Klein's question. I imagine some of you have started working from home recently. Do you think more flexibility in work location and hours help all folks? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Just you know, in general, being able to set your own hours to some extent. We still, I know at Oxide, we've been um, we've been at home since March. 
So yay, it's been, actually it's been, it's been better than we all expected. Like there's been, you know, a little ADB dips some productivity, but overall people have been doing great, but we've been very, very cognizant. Like, you know, a lot of us have families and stuff and like things come up, kids got a zoom call that has to be managed. And you know, we're always trying to be very conscious. Like if someone needs to push their hours and work at night, they're working at night, whatever. Just, you know, if you've got an important meeting, try to be there. Even if the kid's crying in the background, it is what it is. Who cares? Um, just try to do the best you can with what you have. And like everyone's trying to be very um, gracious about it, which is good. I've heard horror stories from other companies that are not doing this, but I think that's on those companies, management and leadership teams to then try to do a better job. And a lot of that is company culture driven. Jay, yeah, I'd and, and I agree with thoughts that too. On workplace oh. accommodations what you think works, what you think doesn't work. Wonder Jay, by the way, is one of our mods. So if you've been booted and banned, he's a guy, no, uh, he's one help me the chat runs smoothly. Did you ask me a question? Um, uh, what, can, what are your thoughts on workplace accommodations? What do you think helps the most? Uh, well, I actually, um, lucky for me i have a, a job coach that kind of helps uh i grew up with tourettes and aspergers uh which they don't call it that anymore i think it's just somewhere on the spectrum now is what they say uh but i'm considered one of the uh, high function ones if you will uh because i've always but the the accommodations that i've learned it was like, I was always like, uh, I think Catherine said, just nervous to really just ask for that accommodations. Mm -hmm. I kind of have an advocate, I guess, if you will. But what's been encouraging for me is my job really loves me. And they're like, hey, I really want you to do better. We're trying to help you find ways to do better. I have trouble a lot of time spelling. So having those accommodations where they are willing to help out with you, uh, they actually have helped me in the long run. So there is advantages, a lot of advantages of having that and just being willing to speak up is the thing. So my job has really gave me that ability to finally say, Hey, yes, I, I definitely need help. I didn't realize this. And I use a, to type in my notes cause I work in a call center instead of just typing them. You know, on your phone, you have that text-to-speech thing. Mm -hmm. There's also one for the computer. And so I've been using that, and it's made my notes so much better. And it flows better. So having and taking the time to step up and just say, hey, just having confidence. I, I admit, I'm not the best at confidence at times, but I've gotten better over the years. I'm in my 30s now. And just learning what I have and trying to learn ways to what helps me is the things that I wanted to learn and what can help others and everything. And I've always been one for that. So it's it's really cool that when I saw y'all were talking about that, I was like, ah, there's something I'm passionate about. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like Michelle was saying, in, in terms of... Uh, uh, working from home that's been great as well but also i need structure and that's been incredibly hard to do on my own <laughs> as i've learned um because i've always had you know go into work that's like you get in that work mode and i'm good and there's not as many distractions and i have every distraction here <laughs> that's not good <laughs> i'm there with you on that yeah. i cannot do it I'm very ADD, and it's just, <laughs> when I was at home working from home, I was distracted so much. But luckily, they have it safe. There's not a lot of us there at the office, but it's just been, uh, I've, there, there is some advantage at working at home. I think I could do it now for what I know what I have to do, but I feel you on that one. Yeah. For and, and me, oh. Uh, for me, the, I have my uh, desktop PC right next to my working PC, uh, and the difference between uh, having them both on versus only having the work PC on uh, just makes it so much easier to, to be productive. Exactly. Yeah. 
that's what I was going to say. I got, I finally got a desk, which sounds silly, but I don't, I, again, when we were going in, I didn't need one. I have such a small space, as you can see, that's my bed. <laughs> and so just having that small space, like, helped so much, not only because, oh, I have an actual setup, but when I sit down in this chair, it's like, this is work. And so that helps a lot. Um, we're getting a lot of great input in the chat as well. I'd love to get some of the feedback on this. First, Ryan followed up and said, I have a friend on the spectrum who also has trouble with spelling. Glad to hear your workplace is helping you with that. Um, we've been talking about the confidence part. Shadow Hope Art says, I know that my perspective on not taking accommodations is a feeling that I won't have those accommodations out at a real job. So getting used to them would be a bad idea. So I love, I mean, I think you've been talking about that already, but I'd love some more emphasis to that because we have employers on, in chat what can be done to make the workplace more uh, accepting and accommodating. Yeah. Um, and that is definitely on the management and leadership side to do that. Um, from what I've seen, a lot of, I've worked at a lot of different companies. It's not that they don't want to provide accommodations, it's that they literally don't even think about it. It's so foreign to them to even think that this isn't going to work for you. It works for everybody else. Well, what's the problem? And if, so if you don't bring it up, they it's not that they're trying to be malicious. They literally don't know. Um, so, yeah, and, and unfortunately, you do have to then, someone has to have that confidence and then talk to the manager and be like, well, can can we do something about this? It's kind of thinking about like um, like 10 years ago with the um, ergonomic movement, like when that first started happening, poor was like, I have to buy you a new desk and a new chair and a new keyboard. What? But then now it's like, you know, accept it. Like, yeah, what ergonomic keyboard do you want? Because we don't want you to get carpal tunnel and have your wrist fall off. Um, so it's, we, we unfortunately have to be the first step to bring it to many people's attention. Um, and you know, and ed basically start educating them that there are certain things they can do to make life easier and better. And like, never, ever, ever go back to goddamn open floor space, um, floor space <laughs> floor plan, because I worked in one of those places and I wanted to murder everybody by the end of the day. Oh my God, the worst thing ever. <laughs> Just like, oh, oh, why are there 60 people in this room all talking? There's noise and distractions and so things much. everywhere. And I just want to like die into the corner and roll up in a ball. And like, I have actually at one point curled up under my desk and I was like, I'm just going to go sit under here for a while. <laughs> I don't want to be in space anymore. Like, the idea that the physical space can be just like too much and damaging and horrific just doesn't, you know, you're like, oh, well, it's great because it fosters communication. You're like, what is it foster communication? <laughs> I'm fostering this. <laughs> no, I need my own space. I need, I need quiet. I need, you know, if you want to come in, send me a message. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah I, we, work, uh, uh, I work uh, in uh, cubicles. Uh, at my job, uh, I used to work in cubicles. That was many months ago. Um, <laughs> and most of the time, it's fine. <laughs> but there's uh, a couple times where... Those be people in the earshot, and I absolutely cannot focus on anything else. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just that, just inability to focus. Mm -hmm. But other times it's like it's kind of like a dagger, and it's uh, like hurting my ears. And there's not like a good explanation as to why. It's just kind of sensitivity to that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh and unfortunately for me, like I can throw on headphones and I'll be good because I control that sound. And that's kind of what I've realized is it's that it, as far as sound goes, it's a control thing. So I can turn it up. I can turn it down. I can pause it. I can do whatever. But I can't if someone's over there scratching, you know, as they're writing. And I know that's they can't help it. They need to write, but it's still driving me up a wall. Like I can't. What do I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great stuff. We have another question. Uh, and actually, uh, first of all, as an employer and a coworker, one thing that always bothers me is when someone clearly has issues and is not finding accommodations and just trying to bull through it. I noticed mm -hmm. this uh, way back in the White Wolf days. I didn't really place them on the spectrum. Now I've got better knowledge. But seeing one of the coworkers just trying to force through what was clearly an issue just made everything more difficult for everyone or if they just sought accommodations it would have been a, a much better situation for all of us so yeah. um we have a question from artisan jpeg what could a teacher say or do to encourage you to take advantage of help i think the 
best thing to do would just be upfront about uh, upfront about it. Just take them aside uh, and say, "Hey, uh, you have this thing available to you. Uh, maybe you feel like you're too proud to use it, uh, but uh, it's always uh, nice to be able to accept help when you're given. So really think about." Uh, if you want to take it. Yeah, and unfortunately, I do think it is on the teacher and, is in like, and the employer to sometimes make that first step and be upfront about it, like you say. Just like, hey, it's here for you to use. I'm okay with this. Would you like to use it? It's your choice. Yeah. But then, yeah, because then if you present it to them, I guess, in that, or to us in that manner, when it's, you know, hopefully they'll then take advantage of it because it's, you know, you don't then have to be the first person to make that step that's being brought to you, which can sometimes make it easier. Yeah, just a quick addition. That uh, will be the best answer to a lot of things, is just being clear and direct. <laughs> yeah. All right, I agree and, and 100%. It's, and it's like Andrew said, like he, he was noticing people that, you know, were, were struggling, and sometimes you don't even, like, you do realize you're struggling, but then you're caught in the struggle loop, <laughs> and you can't break out of it. And if someone's like, like, hey, you know, what's going on? <laughs> How can we help? Yeah. Like goes a long way well let's explore a little bit more of the uh, student to employment uh process so for instance when i first started teaching game development i had a student bring to me one of the accommodation forms saying they needed extra time in tests and i said that's great but we don't take tests in this class do you need any other kind of accommodations making games and the student didn't know what they needed but obviously there were going to be issues working in teams needed to figure out ways to work more effectively with teams so let's talk about that i mean in the workplace, what you need isn't more time taking tests. It's a variety of other processes that involve how you interact with people, customers, um, the company, and so forth. You have in your list about the hiring process. So let's talk about that. You've, you've made it through school. What do you need to be successful working with groups in your school? And then what do you need to get hired? And then what should you do once you are working? So... I think a lot of it also depends on where the individual struggles um, and that can then inform how the accommodations can work. Um, I know when we do stuff, we tend to do a lot of things in meetings, which is very stressful for a lot of people because then they feel like they have to say something and then they don't want to say something. And then their ideas are never heard because there's a bunch of like alpha dogs in the room and they're all like discussing stuff and they're just like, <laughs> which has been very, very off putting. Um, so what I've been trying to do, like as a manager at the company is, um, have people be able to write stuff in on their own and then send it directly and then not have to actually participate in those voiced meetings. And like, sometimes they'll just do it in a chat. Sometimes they'll actually do it in the chat meeting, but then not forcing them to use a medium that they're not comfortable with, like talking. Um, cause it's fine. We can then read your text or even if you want to say it anonymously, we can still bring your idea forward and it's then... You don't have to be into that uncomfortable situation and you can um, still participate in a way that you feel able to. Um, and I'm fine doing that. I would hope other managers are fine doing that. But, um, but yeah, it's, it was one of those things where they didn't ask for it um, again. And a lot of times it was more of like the, hey, I noticed you're not participating. Did you want to say something? Are you just listening? And then it wasn't until I asked them, they're like, well, I kind of, and then, then it all kind of came out. So again, it's about that. So oftentimes having to make the first step. Oh. Yeah. That made me laugh because that's, that's me. I don't, <laughs> I hadn't even realized that I was like just personal revelation there during my lab meetings. Um, but yeah, I would often it, just email my professor before it's like, hey, we should do this. And then he'll bring it up during those meetings. Um, mm -hmm. himself. And that's, yeah. that's helped a whole lot. Um, Right, yeah, well, so a lot of it is like thinking about other ways of doing processes, especially if you notice that you're leaving out people in general. Like if someone's, if there's a group of people that are constantly not participating, that, that should be a, um, a key that something, something's not working with this process. But then also that has the same problem of like changing processes constantly then drives people bonkers because <laughs> you've disrupted the structure. Um, I know it drives me bonkers. <laughs> well, but... 
Hmm? Let's talk about the interview itself, because yeah. uh, I know for a lot of people on the spectrum, there's a fear that if they bring up the topic, it will be held against them. And of course, we really know that any game studio that is not interacting with people on the spectrum is handicapping itself. I use handicap uh, very purposefully there. Uh, yeah. it, obviously, folks on the spectrum have been great employees at many studios. But what mm -hmm. should someone do when they go into the interview? I actually wouldn't mind it being brought up by the interview at all. Like I personally, as a hire, would not hold it against them. But I have heard that before. They felt like they had to hide it because um, they felt like then, yeah, as you said, like they wouldn't hire them just because of that label. Um, whereas, like when I was hiring for my systems designer position, like I had made them say that they were OCD. I'm like, good, that's a good thing. I want an OCD person <laughs> in this position. I need someone like that for this job. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I mean, and I, and I can only speak for like where I'm working now, some of the places, but I can, I can definitely see that a certain company culture is bringing that up in the interview, though, would most likely be taken as a detriment. But then at the same time, if that's their culture, maybe you don't want to work there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if they're in the interview. If they're turned off by that, think about working with those people then too. Um, I would, I would be an advocate for bringing it up in like, and not just blurting it out like, you know, Hey, by the way, but you know, if it came up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> kind of natural. <laughs> well, I, you know, sometimes I just have to introduce myself that way. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, okay. go, on. go ahead. You can go ahead. I was just going to add that uh, for me personally, I prefer uh, doing interviews over the phone versus in person just because that way I don't have to worry about like maintaining eye contact or facial expressions or anything. We actually had a, a, a quick little like meeting last week, I think, at the office specifically about like, you know, were we being overly harsh in interviews about some of these kinds of more Asperger type traits, like, you know, the nervousness or kind of like fidgetiness and like, you know, I, someone brought up eye contact and like, you know, a few of the interviews we were wondering are like starting to just like, you know, they were holding that against them um, in the interview process saying like, oh, they're going to be like, uncomfortable to talk to I didn't really enjoy it and then uh, one of our founders brought up he's like but you know those are all Asperger's traits we can't not hire someone because they have Asperger's and so we need to stop doing it I was like <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. so um so I, I think a lot of it is driven by that kind of company culture though so it, and if it's not there where you're working it could be a good thing to start bringing it up like hey or talk to HR um if you're not mm -hmm. comfortable talking to your lead about like are we how are we doing this um, and if you are interviewing, I mean, like, yeah, like I do the, the trick. I don't stare at your eyeballs. I look here. And yeah, you don't, the, you don't stare at eyeballs? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. I, I will never look you in the eye. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> I was always taught to. And yeah. whenever I did the interview of the job I got now, the, that's, well, I did look away a couple of times because it's just more of a nervous trait, mm -hmm. if you will. I didn't explain all my stuff right away, but as we gone on with conversation and everything, and they kind of got the feel that I was, was, uh, but they were like, I wouldn't have known until you mentioned it, but it's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, and I know like what I try to do in some of my interviews is just get the person, especially when they look very, very nervous, just even if, you know, they're nervous, get them talking about something they like, um, even if it's not really directly related, because then they, tend to loosen up and then maybe you'll even hit on a special interest type thing and then really see that person open up and then you'll get a at least for me a much better idea of like how, how would it be an interact with this person regardless of and that's what state. that's what mine did was exactly what you just said and it helped yeah, yeah exactly like um like i said I, I i'm still in academia but i know um i didn't really have an interview necessarily with my professor because I, I work i work in his lab but it was more like i found him i was like hey you're doing some cool stuff and then like later on like as we were going down to do different trips and stuff that's when i'm, I'm opened up more to him about this he's like oh <laughs> that makes so much more sense and then we started like i was able to work a lot better with him because he knew that uh, no i'm not avoiding your email it mm -hmm. got buried I saw it and there wasn't that snooze option yet. And I just forgot about it. Like, just come poke me again. Like, please. Um. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that just that answer of being upfront about it is usually almost yeah. the right thing to do always. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing, but like, you know, sending me a wall of text. 
I'm not going to read the wall of text. Send me a pretty picture. I'll look at the pretty picture. I much prefer visuals. Um, and, you know, I would be happy to accommodate employees if they said that too. Like, you know, can you do this more in visuals than text? That would be good to know because I want them as an employee to be working at their best capacity. And if they don't say how they want to process the information, I can't guess that. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of it does come into the idea that, you know, you have to work on being more confident in bringing up what you need to your employer. Yeah, a series and, of and, good questions from Puzzled yeah. by Joe. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. Hi, Joe! <laughs> Do you wrestle with how much you should try to adapt versus how much your employers slash coworkers should adapt? For example, less taking the blurting behavior. Some people on the spectrum exhibit the blurting behavior. Should they work on that at all? Or should the coworkers learn to understand and tolerate that behavior or a mix of the two? I tend to try to do a mix of the two. I don't think it's fair for either side to insist that it has to be exactly their way. There usually is something that both sides can do. Um, I have worked with coworkers like that as well before. Um, and yeah, and at some point, yeah. It's going to happen. You need to just deal with it. And I know some people would like take walks around the building and, and solve, like one of the guy I'm thinking in particular, he would knew when it was about to start becoming more uncontrollable. And so he would actually just go for a walk for five minutes and everyone understood like, he's going for his walk, just leave him alone and it's fine. And if it still happens, you don't give him shit about it and you don't talk crap about it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you wouldn't do the same thing again, replace that word with some other thing like, so-and-so is a girl, fuck her. I mean, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> So it's just, you know, I think it's just learning to be a bit more accepting that people aren't like you in general. Yeah. But. Yeah. And, and um, for like I said, for me, my whole family's ADD. So like interrupting each other, like that's just normal. Like that's not rude. That's just what we do. It's like, oh, wait, no, let's jump on this. And then we'll like redirect the conversation. But I also have recognized not everyone's is that way. I don't see that as rude, but. I know other people do and I feel like I should work like work with that and they, you know I will always slip up with that I can't help it it just mm -hmm. happens um but I, I do actively try to work on it because I, I want to hear everybody else has to say and not just the the Catherine show <laughs> but yeah because I'm also very bad at that in meetings yeah. like I yeah. especially now that we're remote and you can't see when someone's about to start talking I will definitely jump on top of people. <laughs> um, so I've actually had to start like writing stuff down physically before I say shit. Cause then that at least gets it down. I don't have to then fucking burn it out in front of somebody and then wait for like that lull um, and then can say it. And the actual physical act of writing it down first helps the need to be like, ah! I mean, but it still, it still happens. Yeah. Yeah. Or like right now I have my little stress ball I'm sitting here playing with. So <laughs> I just say stop. Yeah. I kind of have the opposite, where a lot of the times I'll just keep waiting and waiting for like mm -hmm. a, a, an opening to feel like it's my turn to speak. And that might lead to just the conversation moving on past that without ever getting a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and again, it's hard with the rule, but I feel like at some point, too, then the moderator for the meeting should also make sure that before moving on to a new topic that everyone's had a chance to um to weigh in especially if you know in certain groups of people that there tend to be the like the alpha contributors and if everyone else is saying anything that would be a good clue then to be like cool good discussion is there any other comments from this side of the room thank you stop talking please um but yeah and then that's unfortunately on them to do that um and I'll jump in and say that uh, we as game designers need to take a clue from our initiative systems where everyone has to declare an action. <laughs> I have found this invaluable in games. Go around the table. Everyone declares their action. I found it invaluable in meetings. Everyone <laughs> declares something about the issue we're discussing right now. Yeah, everyone's coming out like of the box. Now, Smur notes that public speaking is actually there in the most common fears. Is that an additional issue for you, Catherine, with the stress ball? Uh, yes. Um, I... I'm that weird combination of like Ben was saying, I, I will wait and wait and wait and wait, especially if I took my meds. I intentionally didn't this time. So you guys are welcome. <laughs> uh, you're getting full ADD. Um, <laughs> I thought it might be good. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, yeah, I, I'm not very big on talking in, in public spaces. And in fact, this like terrified me last night. And I was like, but why? <laughs> like, 
<laughs> it's not scary. They're just, just talking about something that you deeply care about and trying to get that message out there. Like, just be you um, mm -hmm. and show what that is. Yeah. Yeah. And I know with me, I got more, only got more comfortable doing public yeah. speaking the more I did it. And then I did a lot of theater in college. Mm -hmm. And that actually helped a lot. Because then it's this idea that you're playing a role in a different person. It's not you. So if you say something stupid, it wasn't you. It was the character. Um, <laughs> and then even at that point, like, you know, I do know that when I go into like public speaker mode, even sometimes like manager mode, I am actually playing certain characters, even still, like I'm now manager Michelle. And then I go back to being more like worker B person afterwards. But it is definitely like, put on hat, like literal physical thing, and then like have memorized specific lines and words to say phrases to you. <laughs> it's like, not even joking. Yeah. <laughs> this is what manager does. Because <laughs> yeah, otherwise, and it's the uh, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, I generally feel like I'm more of a laid back person, but like you said, going into into um, like I I'm the lead person on a a big project in our lab, and at one time I did have a team, <laughs> so I did have to go in and be like, all right, we need to do this, this, and this. Whereas I normally would have just been like, all right, guys, what are you up to, like? fill me in but like said no it's like playing it's putting on a, a a role and that helps a lot to look at it kind of that way for sure yeah does our mod have anything to add wonder jay i haven't done any public speech in, speaking sorry in a long time this is probably the first time in a very very long you're time you're a live I streamer <laughs> That doesn't it's count. Not the same thing. Dang it! He, he <laughs> ratted me out. He ratted me out. No, I, I was. I'm being silly. Um, no, it's a lot of fun. And I think streaming has really helped me in the long run. I got to get back to doing it more. I would love to be able to somehow get in the gaming industry some way, but it's been difficult for me because I'm like not. I guess I'm like that confidence that we were talking about. There's some of that with that and everything. But I love I love getting to interact with people that are in the chat and everything. I get goofy sometimes. Andrew can attest to that. Just being silly. Just being myself. And, and it's a lot of fun. And I get called Derp and stuff. My nickname is the Bat Derp. But if you'll see my avatar you'll see why everybody's like that's batman i said no you got to get it right it's a bat dirt batman is already taken and it's not robin Patton. no i'm just kidding <laughs> ben, you, uh, you said they're not the same would love your input on that uh it's absolutely not the same because with streaming uh you're just like doing the thing uh your own thing uh whatever it is gaming or development and maybe you're talking, being active a bit more, chatting with people, but there's no faces there. You don't have to, you can just pretend like the audience is like a faceless amalgam that you don't have to worry about. With uh, public speaking, uh, it's like a lot more you're speaking at people, I would say. Uh, and so uh, it's a bit of terrifying, but also I like having attention on me so it's like what do you do about that <laughs> yes i have my small group i like to give me attention not not everybody else has too much <laughs> yeah and with uh with streaming uh generally that's you're going to be closer to the the group because it'll be usually the same people turning out again and again. So you'll feel closer to them versus with public speaking. Uh, even if it's an audience with a bunch of people you know, there'll still be a bunch more people who you won't know. That's true. Well, just remember that there are more than 40 people watching you right now. So, Oh, oh man. <laughs> 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 All right, we've got one more minute, uh, and then uh, their next presentation actually kind of grows nicely out of this. Uh, Elisa Lewis will be presenting on growing your creative business in good times and bad. So I'm going to throw out a topic, but I'd like each of you to close with whatever thought you want to 
What are the things you should look out for in the workplace that let you know that it'll either be a good one or a bad one for you? Wonder Jay, you can either take that question or just say whatever you want as we close out this session. <laughs> oh, you pick me first. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I know, if I know it's going to be a bad one, which I've I've had so many jobs in my past, uh, there was one where I could tell, even for me, that they were going, they were kind of taking advantage of my skills and making me do things, but I wasn't given the proper feedback. And I, I'm, I need that. I need accountability to help me get better in myself. Uh, when I know that it's not working out, uh, and I could see that it's not something that I would be more passionate about to stick with, if that makes sense, uh, because I'm not getting the help that I need. Uh, I don't. I, I know that it's not for me, if that makes sense. Makes sense. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say, I guess it's uh, something, uh, first you could just ask them like directly about it, um, which I haven't done in the past, and I haven't had to job search in a while because I've been at the same location for a while, but if you don't want to ask them directly, then it's something you'd have to kind of uh, figure out based on, you could like weasel around it by like asking about their culture and try and figure it out from there. And that's kind of what I was going to say is, um, I don't have anything directly, but you know, it, you have a group of people out there like ADD doesn't exist. Like there's there's books written about it, and that's <laughs> you know if that ever came up, that would be a big red flag for me. But I don't, I haven't really run into that kind of thing personally. What do you mean it doesn't exist? Yeah, it, you just made it, it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, part of it is because you know all these kids are super hyper. Like that's not ADD. That's just kids being kids. Well, yeah, for most of them. <laughs> Yeah, culture is definitely important. It's something I also like to look for. It's just general diversity in the workplace. Like if it's 99 white dudes that are all single, that's probably a bad sign because they're just hiring <laughs> people who are like fitting a very specific little mold. Yeah. Or it's even when you're interviewing or meeting the team, if there's if there's a wide variety of people, race, gender, um, orientation, all that stuff, then that's a pretty good indicator that it's a workforce who's willing to um, celebrate diversity and want to work with diversity and they'll be much more comedy than also with you need something a little bit different. And We're looking for programmer <laughs> rock stars. <laughs> and especially like in games, I, I didn't anywhere, but I, I in games, especially like getting that input from all those different perspectives, I think is great because then you get, you get the stuff out there for everybody, not just, yeah. like you said, single, single, you know, 20s white dude. <laughs> There's and we love our 20 year old white dudes. Yeah. Like they're great employees, but they're are also. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not, not the single 20 dude. Yeah. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to bring up before you leave is that if you are a manager or lead and you don't know much about this and you want to know more, this is a great book. Sorry if it's backwards to check out. It's called Divergent Mind. You can pick it up at your library. Um, it is a wonderful overview of like just the neurodivergence landscape. And it's not very long, won't take very long to get through. And it pretty much runs through all the different kinds of documented um, types and just gives you a very good breakdown for like what it is, how it can represent, and then it can be a good starting off point for like figuring out what you can do as an employee. And to plug it a little better, it's in a three for two sale on Amazon. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Let me buy three of them. <laughs> well, it's yeah. a bunch of other wow. Yeah. Send, send them to friends. Uh, do any of you else have anything to plug? Wonder Jay, what's your stream? You said you streamed. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I'm in a transition because I might start streaming on mm. YouTube. Uh, because it's. I, I shouldn't say that. We're on Twitch. What's wrong with me? I'm just kidding. Arbo. <laughs> uh, yeah, Arbo. Yeah, Arbo. Uh, I just, I'm thinking about getting back into more content creating a little bit. So, uh, making videos and stuff again. But I'm in the pondering stage and brainstorming again. I'm so, a very liar. 
I I'm wonder I'm wonder J seven eighty six on Twitch and also YouTube. Yeah. There you go. Cool. If you're a programmer, we're hiring. We have like six open programming positions. Who is we? Website. Oxide Games. We're in Maryland. Sorry, Jordan. I, do, I, do, <laughs> I don't know how to program, but I can learn hands on. <laughs> Uh, and if you missed it uh, from the last hour, I, f I just finished my game Pushermo, which is out on itch for five dollars. Push blocks. Uh, shoot, I don't remember. Push, <laughs> push blocks form clears or die trying. Yeah, and go. all the proceeds are go to the I, autistic I self advocacy. There you go. I forget the middle part. <laughs> they have their own awesome. uh, event this this weekend that I want to check out. All right, great cool. session. Thank you all. You all are going to be in the Discord chat, right? Yes, yeah. except I have to go to another session, so I'll be here for about 10 minutes. Oh, I guess right. so. Hope you guys sign up for <laughs> Michelle's uh, VBA and Excel workshop. All right, thank you all. And Elisa Lewis will be next to talk about uh, growing your creative workplace in good times and bad. Thank you all very much.